Well, good morning. Welcome to a, another beautiful, beautiful day here at uh, Jesus and Jean's Worship at the Cottage. Uh, my name is Teddy Baker, and uh, along with my wife Jan and Jim and Sandra Penner, we uh, we have this worship service every Sunday. And you know, as I always say, the cool thing is you, you people keep showing up, <laughs> and uh, we're so glad that you do. Uh, it's, Today, if you're joining us via the internet, we are, are especially glad to have you as well. We uh, stream our services on a weekly basis, and um, literally, we go around the world. And uh, just you know, by the miracle of uh, um, internet, and you know, I, I thank Al Gore every day for. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, sir. Oh, I'm just joking now. <laughs> But uh, we're going to do a little praise and worship. I want to wish everybody uh, a happy Father's Day. And for all you guys, happy Father's Day. For the rest of you that have fathers, and uh, we want to wish you a happy Father's Day. Whether your father is still with us or if he's uh, gone on to be with the Lord, you know, we, uh, we, we thank God for our fathers. That's what we're going to talk about today. So what are the godly qualities? of fathers and uh, we're going to take a look at that but first let's do a little singing is everybody warmed up and ready to go yeah. mm. yep. that's not encouraging <laughs> <laughs> Say I need 
you more and never before I need you Lord I need you Lord more than the air I breathe more than the song I sing more than the next heart by your side cause I never want to go back to my own life I need you more more than yesterday I need you more more than words can say I need you more and never before I need you, Lord. I need you, Lord. More than the air I breathe, more than the song I sing, more than the next heart more than anything the Lord is time goes by. I'll be by your side. Cause I never want to go back to my old life. I need you more. More than yesterday, I need you more. More than words can say, I need you more. And This morning, and uh, I have a couple of special prayer requests that I'd like for all of you to, to join me in. Uh, first of all, we want to pray for uh, the Allison family, and uh, a friend of ours that uh, comes regularly uh, with Angela, a gentleman named Colt, uh, Daniel Allison, was uh, was his best friend for over 30 years, and. Um, and this past week, uh, Daniel decided to take his life. And, um, and so it's been uh, not only a, a heavy time for the family, but uh, for this friend of ours. And uh, so we want to keep the Allison family uh, lifted in prayer. It's always difficult to face that time. A lot of difficult questions. And so we want to remember them. I want to pray especially for a, a friend of mine from my hometown in Union, South Carolina. I have a, a friend of mine uh, who's been a lifelong friend, a lady by the name of Crystal Gallman. And she's uh, taken a, really a, a life position in raising her grandchild, Tori. When Tori was, was born, uh, she had underdeveloped lungs, and they the doctors told her that uh, she would never make it through the first winter. And Crystal, uh, not listening to the doctors, took Tori home and just treated her like a normal child and continued to raise her. And uh, then they found a, a malignant tumor. And after four months of chemo, the doctor said, well, five or ten years at best. And um, this past May, Tori turned 19. And uh, she truly is a, a miracle, miracle child. And Crystal has dedicated her life to taking care of Tori. Tori has some very special needs. And uh, here recently, I don't know whether it's the allergies or the pollen, I know they've been driving me nuts. And, but uh, something has, has caused, uh, what happens is, as, again, her, as Tori grew, her lungs were undeveloped. And so as she grew, her lungs did not grow. And so she's on a ventilator and a, a trach, and, uh, and, and this is a 24-7 ministry of, of Crystal. And um, so she dropped me a little message over Facebook and said, you know, would you have your group pray for Tori this morning? Because 
and she's having some difficulties breathing. And uh, so we want to certainly lift her up today. Both of these families, uh, God is still in the miracle working business. Even when we don't understand all aspects of the frailties of the human condition, God is still at work. So let's pray together. Father, we do thank you for this day. What a, a beautiful day in these North Georgia mountains. And Lord, we, we lift up these two families to you that I've mentioned. And God, we, we cannot even imagine uh, the loss of a child. Especially uh, in a time when depression is, is so great and, and the only way out uh, is, is to take a life, to take your life. And so, Lord, we lift up the Allison family here today and, and just pray that you would just garrison around them and, Holy Spirit, that you would come and minister to them in a very special way. I pray, Father, as the comforter that you sent, God, that, that the Holy Spirit would just bring comfort and peace to them in a situation that is just... Um, mind-boggling and overwhelming to say the least we pray your blessings upon them father and then for Tori Lord as the great physician we ask that you would bring healing to her lungs and that you would allow her to to continue to live and to be a testimony of your love and your grace and your power to allow this young lady to live a life we pray for Crystal and her family and especially for all it takes uh, to be committed to doing uh, life with Tori on a daily basis. We ask your special blessing over both of them this morning, Lord. Now, God, we, we pray for our time together as we talk about fathers today. Lord, what greater role model than we have than you. And as we talk about the godly qualities of fathers, I pray that you will allow us as men, as husbands, as fathers, to hear your word and to apply it to our hearts and lives that, again, we may go forward and engage the world around us on your behalf. It's in Jesus' name that we pray, Father. And all God's children said, Amen. Amen. Well, one thing I wanted to bring up, uh, we had a, a good friend of ours, Beach, that some of you from Paradise Valley uh, know. And Beach brought us a, a case of Bibles. And these are Gideon Bibles, and they're the English uh, Standard Version, the ESV, which is a great translation, by the way. And um, so... <laughs> Got creatures following around. So uh, we're, we're putting them out here. If you need a Bible, we want to encourage you to take one. If you know somebody that needs a Bible, please take one and, and give it to them uh, with our blessings because uh, uh, we just don't want them to, to sit around here. I have this little creature following me all day long. He's been around. He's been around? <laughs> that just shows you how much I pay attention. <laughs> Today we're going to talk about godly fathers and the godly qualities of fathers. And what I want to do is take the word father, and just I'm making an acrostic out of the word fathers, plural. And we're going to be reading from Ephesians, in the book of Ephesians. If you have your Bibles, turn there to chapter 6. We're going to read some of the same scriptures that we read for Mother's Day. And uh, one of the cool things about the scriptures is, is the way that, uh, to me, they are divinely inspired, is that God placed a little caveat underneath this writing that Paul wrote uh, to, the, to the people of Ephesus. And he writes in chapter 6, in verse 1 through 3, it says this. It says, children, this is from the message translation, by the way. It says, children, do what your parents tell you. This is only right. 
Honor your father and mother is the first commandment that has a promise attached to it. Namely, so you will live well and have a long life. Evidently, Paul knew my dad. <laughs> you want to live well and have a long life? <laughs> there be, better be some honor up in here. <laughs> and here's the caveat to this scripture that, that I love. It says, fathers, don't exasperate your children by coming down hard on them. Take them by the hand and lead them in the way of the Master. Isn't that beautiful scripture? That's a, a command. That's an imperative statement to say, Fathers, don't wear your children out. Don't come down hard on them. Rather, take them by the hand and lead them in the way of the Master. A lady from Spokane, Washington by the name of Sonora Louise Smart Dodd. It's a bunch of names. <laughs> was the first one to propose the idea of observing, observing a, a special day for fathers. Her idea was that the holiday be centered on special church services. And her reason for the holiday was to honor her father, William Jackson Smart. He was a widowed Civil War veteran who for 21 years was a father and a mother to his six children. Mrs. Dodd wanted the holiday to be celebrated on the first Sunday in June, which was her father's birthday. However, the Spokane Council couldn't meet or couldn't get the first reading until the third Sunday in June. And so in 1924, President Calvin Coolidge supported the idea of a National Father's Day. However, it wasn't until 1966 that President Lyndon Johnson signed a, a presidential proclamation declaring the third Sunday of June as Father's Day. And then in 1972, almost 60 years after Mother's Day had been proclaimed an official holiday, President Richard Nixon established a permanent national observance of Father's Day. A small boy once said, Father's Day is just like Mother's Day, only you don't spend as much on the gift. <laughs> Mark Twain is quoted as, as once saying, When I was a boy of 14, my father was so ignorant, I could hardly stand to have the old man around. But when I got to the 21, I was astonished and how much the old man had learned in seven years. <laughs> One comedian wrote, Now that my father is a grandfather, he just can't wait to give money to my kids. But when I was a kid and asked him for 50 cents, he would tell me the story of his life. <laughs> how he got up at 5 a.m. when he was 70 years old and walked 23 miles to milk 90 cows. And the farmer for whom he worked had no bucket, so he had to squirt the milk in his little hand and then walk eight miles to the nearest can to dump it in. All for five cents. And the result was, I never got my 50 cents. <laughs> But now he tells my children every time he comes into the house, well, let's see how much old granddad, how much money old granddad has and to give to my wonderful grandkids. And the minute they take the money out of his hands, I call them over to me and I snatch it away from them because that's my money. <laughs> Being a parent and a father can be an interesting and, and trying experience. In fact, I learned early on that there are a few things they don't tell you when you sign on with this outfit. <coughs> Someone said parents spend the first part of a child's life urging him or her to talk and walk and the rest of his childhood telling them to sit down and keep quiet. <laughs> One father said to his teenage son, 
Do you mind if I use the car tonight? I'm taking your mother out to eat, and I'd like to impress her. <laughs> uh, the father said to his daughter, What's wrong, Judy? Usually you talk on the phone for hours. This time you only talk for 30 minutes. How come? Judy replied, It was the wrong number. <laughs> Another son wrote home to his dad. He said, Dear Dad, please let me hear from you more often, even if it's only a five or a ten. <laughs> the definition of a father is a, a father is a man who carries pictures in his wallet where his money used to be. I can relate. But I love Paul Harvey's definition of a father. He said, A father is a thing that is forced to endure childbirth without an anesthetic. <laughs> a father never feels worthy of the worship in a child's eyes. He's never quite the hero his daughter thinks and never quite the man his son believes him to be. And this worries him sometimes. So he works too hard to try and smooth out the rough places. The, the rough places in the road for those of his own who will follow him. Fathers are what give daughters away to other men who aren't nearly good enough. Yeah. <laughs> so they can have grandchildren who are smarter than anybody else's. Fathers make bets with insurance companies about who will live the longest. And one day they lose. And the bets paid off to the part of them they leave behind. Both parenting and fatherhood can be a real trial as well as a real blessing. A guy by the name of John Dresser wrote a book titled, If I Could Do It All Again. And in it he shares eight things that he would do differently if he could go through his years of being a father all over again. Here's what he wrote. He said, number one, first of all, if I could do it all over again, I would love my wife more because by loving my children's mother more, I would create an environment of, of security in our home. Our love would be something they could see, something they would never have to worry about. Second, I would laugh more. I would relax and enjoy my children and, and laugh at their antics. I would spend more time with them and enjoy being a father. Third, I would present a more realistic model for my children to follow. I would be honest with them about myself. I would let them know that I had problems in school too. That I stumbled and made mistakes and I failed. I would let them know that I understand and that they can come to me when they fail because I've been there as well. Fourth, I would listen to what they say. I would listen to their plans and problems and worries and concerns. I would listen when they wanted to talk to me because I now realize that if I listen to them when they are small and to their little problems, then when they are big and have big problems, they will still come and talk to me. Fifth, I would stop praying so much for my family because a father's prayers so often sound something like this. God, make my son and daughter good people. Help them to succeed in school. Help them to find the right person to marry. Take care of and protect them. Instead, I would start praying more for myself that I might be the right kind of father, realizing that when I become the right kind of father, my children will probably be the right kind of children. Sixth, I would pay more attention to little things. I would begin to appreciate the touch and love, the touch of love and the word of encouragement. So many times we fathers are quick to criticize their failures and so slow to praise and encourage them when they do something right. Seventh, I would create an environment of belonging. I would want my children to know that they belong and that they are 
important family members because I realized that there are going to be people saying to them, join this and join that. But if they have a solid identity in the home and in the family, they will not easily be led astray. And then number eight, Last but certainly not least, I would make God an intimate friend of my family. I would use His name freely. I would communicate to them that He is involved in all of our family decisions. And I would want them to, to see me pray and, and read God's Word and search for His direction and leadership. Folks, if I, I had to live my life over, I think I would try very seriously to prove on these, these eight areas as well. And so today, again, I want to talk about godly qualities of fathers. And we're going to take the word fathers and just make an acrostic out of it. The F in the word fathers stands for faithful. If you're going to be a godly father, you got to be faithful. Proverbs 3.3 3 says, Let not steadfast love and faithfulness forsake you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. And there are several areas that I think men should be faithful. Number one is being faithful to God. Joshua 24, 14 or 15 are very familiar words. I love reading, I love to preface this statement that Joshua uses because we're very familiar with this, but I want you to hear what Joshua says. Now fear, fear the Lord and serve Him with all faithfulness. Throw away the gods your ancestors worshipped beyond the Euphrates River and in Egypt and serve the Lord. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve. Whether the gods your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. And for us men, if we're going to, that, that took a long time in my life. Although I was exposed to God and the church as a child, there was not enough there to make change and life change in, in my life. And so for a long time, I didn't believe. I had an agnostic view of God. I didn't believe that in evolution, I didn't believe that we crawled out of the swamp. I didn't believe that we come from monkeys although we act like them sometimes. <laughs> I didn't believe that. And I couldn't wrap my head around this, this idea of, of Jesus was what I really struggled with. And I thought, well, there's, maybe there was some gigantic boom and you know, all this happened in some divine force. May the force be with you. you know. We started all of this. But I struggled with it. I was 38, almost 39 years old before I came to know the Lord. And I did everything I could to keep, keep Him at a place to where I, I couldn't really understand Him. Because I spent a lot of time searching. I was a spiritual seeker. I checked it out. If, they, if God was out there, I was going to find Him. Because I was looking for Him. He just showed up in different things. Different types of religion. I tried Buddhism, I tried Scientology, I tried Christian science, I tried Eastern religions, I had pyramids under my bed and you know all kinds of things hanging from the ceiling and you know I did all kinds of things in search of God. And then one day I met him in a still small voice. In the work of a child, I met him. And it changed my life forever. It brought me to a place of faith to where I could truly say, 
I believe. And it caused me to be faithful in the way I looked at life. Another area that I believe that godly qualities show up in faithfulness is being faithful to, to his wife. A man needs to be faithful to his wife. Larry and Janet are celebrating 49 years yesterday in their marriage. Tom and Sherry today celebrating 29 years. How do you do it? <laughs> Jan, we're just on the beginning here. But we celebrate those things. We celebrate godly men who are willing to go the effort, go the extra mile, to hang in there and make it work. That's why Genesis 2.24 2, Genesis 2, I used to use this in premarital counseling. Is that therefore a man shall leave his father and mother. Emphasis on the leave his father and mother. And hold fast to his wife. And that one of the other says, and cleave to his wife. And guess what happens? <laughs> You become one flesh, is what the Bible says. There's no longer my stuff and Jan's stuff, it's our stuff. <laughs> and so a man, I believe, to have a sense of faithfulness, needs to be faithful to God, faithful to his wife, and then faithful to his family. Proverbs 28.20 says, A faithful man will abound with blessings. But whoever hastens to be rich will not go unpunished. When fathers and mothers these days, but especially today we're talking about fathers, when the emphasis is more on the career, when the emphasis is more on moving ahead and having more than the neighbors and keeping up with the Joneses to, to make money and, you know, and all those things, we, we end up Buying things that we don't need to impress people that we don't like. <laughs> Oftentimes. But we've got to keep up with the Joneses. You know, they have a boat. They have whatever. You know, I don't know. I'm not picking on people with boats. I mean, <laughs> wish I had one. <laughs> Got a I do have a rubber ducky. That's right in the jazz. That's close to a boat. It's about as close as we're going to get. But being faithful is important to God. It's, it's easy sometimes to get caught up in the world around you and to forget for a time what's important to your family, especially to your children, and even now to your grandchildren. There was a, one of the writers of Psalms was a guy named Asaph. And he understood how easy it was. And I, I want you to read, I want you to listen to these scriptures. I'm going to read from the message again. It is Psalm 73. And it's verses 1 through 15. And you think that the stuff we face today is just, oh man, this is like a new thing. I, I've never seen the world in the shape that it's in today. I hear people say that all the time. Oh, yeah? <laughs> Been going on a long time. Listen to these scriptures. No doubt about it, God is good. Good to good people. Good to the good hearted. But I nearly missed it, Asaph writes. Missed seeing his goodness. I was looking the other way. Looking up to the people at the top. In being the wicked who have it made, who have nothing to worry about, not a care in the whole wide world. Pretentious with arrogance, they wear the latest fashions in violence. Pampered and overfed, decked out in sick silk bows of silliness. Say that five times real fast. <laughs> silk bows of silliness. They jeer using words to kill. They bully their way with words. They're full of hot air, loud mouths, disturbing the peace. 
People actually listen to them. Can you believe it? Like thirsty puppies, they lap up their words. What's going on here? Is God out to lunch? Nobody's tending the store. The wicked get by with everything. They have it made, piling up riches. I've been stupid to play by the rules. What has it gotten me? A long run of bad luck, that's why. A slap in the face every time I walk out the door. And then he says this. If I had have given in and talked like this, I would have betrayed your dear children. You see, the things that go on in this world have been going on for a long time. There's always been a generation who did not accept God. There's always been a generation to try to turn away believers and influence the world. But the Bible says that we are in the world, but we're not of the world. And Asaph was smart enough to say, I almost missed it because I was looking the other way. And if I had talked like this, I would have betrayed your dear children. You don't have to look far in the world to see how these scriptures fit into our everyday life. Just watch the news for a little while. The letter A stands for authentic. We should be authentic in the way that we live. Jesus truly is for all of us, but especially men, our role model. And when I study the Gospels, Jesus was, as best as I can tell, a real human being. He was one that felt his emotions he felt them robustly. He resiliently and authentically, he, he felt those human emotions. Jesus is our model for living authentically, honestly, fully and passionately every single day of our life. And realize that we as husbands, as fathers, as men, are first and foremost human we make mistakes. And men who live authentic lives should be able to admit when they make a mistake and then they make it right. Not only should we be authentic in the way we live, we should be authentic in the way we love. You know, we often hear the scriptures from 1 Corinthians chapter 13 being used in weddings. You know, love is patient, love is kind. And, and it talks about what love is. But I love the first part of that verse where Paul is, is saying that for him as a man, as an apostle, as a man of God, if love is not present in his life, he talks about what he is if love is not present. Let me read these. He says, if I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I'm a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. In the immortal words of James Brown, that means talking loud and saying nothing. <laughs> and that's what Paul is saying. If I don't have love, I'm just running off at the mouth. I'm just making noise. I'm not making an impact in the people around me. And he says, if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have and if I deliver up my body to be burned but have not love, I gain nothing. One of the things I think most men struggle with is that ability to love, to share love, to feel love. You know, in my house, my dad, we, we had a don't talk, don't tell, you don't cry. You don't cry, you don't talk, you don't tell. Pull yourself up by the bootstraps, suck it up, act like a man. 
and don't talk about your business outside of the family. And that's the way it was. And so I, I never really saw my dad being very affectionate toward my mom. And, and Jan will tell you, I'm not a warm, fuzzy guy. <laughs> I love, and I love deeply. And one of the things that I learned from a, a musician that used to work with me, a, a drummer, his, his family was Italian. They hug everybody. <laughs> and so when I would go to his family's home, I, at least 12 hugs before you got, you know, past the front door. Hey, come back, come here, hey, hey, hey. And I learned to hug. And I went, you know, this is not so bad. This is not bad. You know, I can hug guys. I can hug girls. I can hug dog. I can hug everything. I can hug everybody because hugging's good. Sometimes we just need a hug. There's a story in the diary of Brooks Adams. Brooks Adams was an American historian, political scientist. Lived in the 1800s up to the early 1900s. In his diary is a note about a special day when he was eight years old. He wrote, went fishing with my father, the most glorious day of my life. And through the next 40 years, there were constant references to that day and the influence that it had on his life. Time and time again, Brooks recalled that wonderful day when he and his father went fishing together. But years later, a historian was going through his father's ambassador and, and U.S. diplomat, Charles Francis Adams, was going through his papers and found in his diary the same day that was mentioned. Brooks' father had written, went fishing today with my son. The day was wasted. I wonder how many wasted days have come and gone that were monumental days in the lives of our children and, and we never knew it. I wonder how many things we were going to do and never got around to doing that might have changed a life and molded a personality. We are called to live authentic lives, to be real to be genuine, to be human. The T in the, in the word fathers stands for teacher. Ephesians 6, 4 is, Father, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Teach them. Proverbs 22, 6, train your, up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Titus 2.7, show yourself in all respects to be a model of good works and in your teaching show integrity and dignity. Pay attention, the Bible says, and gain understanding. A pattern developed throughout the Bible. Pay attention. Those are the words that I keep hearing over and over in my head as my dad used to say, Teddy, pay attention. It's good instruction. Many of you probably remember Will Rogers. He died in a plane crash with Willie, a guy named uh, Wiley Post in 1935 and was probably the greatest political brain or wit this country has ever known. He had four children. Will Rogers Jr., uh, who starred as his father in two feature movies and was a war hero successful actor and a congressman. Mary Rogers, she was a Broadway actress. Jim Rogers, after starring in some cowboy movies, uh, as a young man, spent most of his life on a horse and a cattle ranch. Betty and Will Rogers' youngest son, Fred, died of diphtheria when he was two. And Will Rogers had some great sayings that I'm sure that he taught to his children. Some sayings like, Never slap a man who's chewing tobacco. <laughs> That's pretty good in instruction. Never kick a cow chip on a hot day. 
<laughs> there are two theories to arguing with a woman. Neither works. <laughs> Never miss a good chance to shut up. Always drink upstream from the herd. That's a good one. This is what my dad used to tell me all the time. If you find yourself in a hole, stop digging. <laughs> the quickest way to double your money is to fold it and put it back in your pocket. Good judgment comes from experience, and a lot of that comes from bad judgment. If you're riding ahead of the herd, take a look back every now and then to make sure it's still there. Letting the cat out of the bag is a whole lot easier than putting it back. And after eating an entire bull, a mountain lion felt so good he started roaring. He kept it up until a hunter came along and shot him. The moral of the story is, when you're full of bull, keep your mouth shut. <laughs> What kind of instruction did your father give you? My father taught me a lot of things. And I'm sure your father's instructed you as men and as women about some things. Secular things, spiritual things. It's growing up, it's becoming a man, it's becoming a woman. The H in the word father stands for humility. Of all the words that characterize the life of Jesus, love, courage, obedience, grace, leadership, high on that list must be humility. The Son of God began His earthly life with a humble birth in a stable. In a little town, in a village called Bethlehem, He was raised in this humble little town called Nazareth. And he had no place really to call his own, to rest his head at night. In fact, humble is how Jesus described his own character. He said, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart. And you will find rest for your souls. Humility is one of the most desperately needed character traits. How can we develop this trait in our children? I think the first step is helping them have an understanding of what real humility is. Humility in its simplest sense is the ability to consider others ahead of one's self. It's been said that a humble, humble person doesn't think less of himself. He just simply thinks of himself less. Does that make sense? Your kids and your grandkids need to know about what humility may look like in daily life. How genuinely humble people can be confident without being arrogant. And can respect others while maintaining his own self-respect. And a humble person's self-esteem isn't tied to what other people say about him. As Mother Teresa once put it, if you are humble, nothing will touch you, neither praise nor disgrace, because you know what you are. Humility is one of the most commended character traits in all Scripture. And it's an, an important part of our relationship with God. The prophet Micah wrote this, And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God? Jesus often spoke of humility, saying that whoever exalts himself will be humbled and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. Our Savior taught that our reliance on God, our humility before Him, should be the same as that of a little child. So many virtues flow from this quality called humility. Respectfulness, kindness, generosity, compassion, patience. 
Humility includes all of these qualities. Many years ago, a writer came across some soldiers who were trying to move a heavy log without success. The corporal was standing by as the men struggled, and the writer asked the corporal why he wasn't helping. The corporal replied, I'm the corporal. I give orders. The writer dismounted, went up and stood by the soldiers, and as they were lifting the log, he helped them, and with his help, the log was moved, and the writer quietly mounted his horse and went to the corporal and said, the next time your men need help, send for the commander-in-chief. After he left, the corporal and his men found out that the writer was George Washington. The message is clear. Success and humility go hand in hand. The letter E is to be an encourager. 1 Thessalonians 5.11 it says this, God didn't set us up for an angry rejection, but for salvation by our master, Jesus Christ. He died for us, a death that triggered life. Whether we are awake with the living or asleep with the dead, we are alive in Him. So speak encouraging words to one another. Build up hope so you'll all be together in this. No one left out. No one left behind. I know you're already doing this. Just keep on doing it. The Bible says keep on encouraging one another. Ephesians 4.29 says, Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up, as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. Miss Thompson taught a young child named Teddy Stollard. I like his name. <laughs> Teddy was in the fourth grade. He was slow and an unkempt student, a loner, shunned by his classmates. The previous year, his mother died, and what little motivation for school he may have once has now gone. Miss Thompson didn't particularly care for Teddy either. But at Christmas time, he brought her a small present. Her desk was covered with well-wrapped presents from the other children, but Teddy came in and his was in a brown sack. When she opened it, there was a, a gaudy rhinestone bracelet with half the stones missing and a bottle of cheap perfume. The children began to snicker, but Miss Thompson saw the importance of the moment, she quickly splashed on some of the perfume and put on the bracelet, pretending Teddy had given her something special. At the end of the day, Teddy worked up enough courage to softly say, Miss Thompson, you smell just like my mother. And her bracelet looks real pretty on you too. I'm glad you like my presence. After Teddy left, Miss Thompson got down on her knees and prayed for God's forgiveness. She prayed for God to use her as she sought not only to teach these children, but to love them as well. And she became a new teacher. She lovingly helped students like Teddy. And by the end of the year, he had caught up with most of the students. And Miss Thompson didn't hear from Teddy for a long time. Then she received this note that said, Dear Miss Thompson, I wanted you to be the first to know. I will be graduating second in my class. Love, Teddy Stollard. Four years later, she got another note. Dear Miss Thompson, they just told me I will be graduating first in my class. And I wanted you to be the first to know. The university has not been easy, but I liked it. Love, Teddy Stollard. And then four years later, Dear Miss Thompson, as of today, I am Theodore Stollard, M.D. Mm. How about that? I wanted you to be the first to know. And I am getting married next month. And I want you to come and sit where my mother would sit if she were alive. You are the only family I have now. Dad died last year. Love, Teddy Stollard. Miss Thompson went to the wedding and sat where Teddy's mother would have sat. Because she let God use her as an instrument of encouragement. It makes a difference, beloved.
It makes a difference when we encourage one another. It's easy to pick each other apart. I used to work with a guy who found it humorous to pick on other people's shortcomings. I never liked that. I know what my shortcomings are. <laughs> I can promise you that. The R stands for being resourceful. 1 Timothy 5.8 says, Anyone who does not provide for their relatives, and especially for their own household, has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. I, remind, I remember my dad being a good provider. For as long as I knew him, he worked in textiles in the cotton mill. And by way of a correspondence course, he became a mechanical engineer because he had a scholarship to go to Clemson University, but when he got there, his dad died of a massive heart attack at 47. And so my dad had to leave Clemson, go back home, and get a job and raise nine brothers and sisters. He was a brilliant man. He was very creative. He was an artist, a, a fisherman. He served his country in World War II on a destroyer. He, had a, he was a man of numerous talents. But most of all, my dad was a good provider. We didn't have a lot, but we never went hungry. And whatever it took, there was always food on the table and clothes on my back. He created in me a great work ethic. He made me work for the things that I wanted. And on occasion, he bent over backwards to provide something special for me. He gave me the opportunity to pursue my dreams in music. He, he wasn't always there at every performance. And we all certainly didn't always see eye to eye. But he gave me the freedom to do what I love to do. That was to play and sing music that I loved. We as men need to be resourceful to do whatever it takes to provide for our family. The Bible commands us to do so. Then the last letter is S, and it stands for strong. Ephesians 6.10 through 13 says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand... Stand. Be strong in the Lord. Columnist Irma Bombeck received a letter from a single mom whose son was asking the question, what does a father do? And as she pondered this question, she came up with this answer. She wrote, he threw them higher than his head until they were weak from laughter. He cast the deciding, the deciding vote on the puppy debate. <laughs> he listened more than he talked, and he let them make mistakes. He allowed them to fall from their first two-wheeler without having a heart attack. And he read a newspaper while they were trying to parallel park a car for the first time in preparation for their driving test. If I had to tell someone's son what a father really does that is important, it would be that he shows up for the job in good times and bad times. He's a man who is constantly being observed by his children. They learn from him how to handle adversity, anger, disappointment, and success. He won't laugh at their dreams no matter how impossible they may seem. He will dig out at 1 a.m. when one of his children runs out of gas. He will make unpopular decisions and stand by them. When he's wrong and makes a mistake, he will admit it. 
He sets the tone for how family members treat one another, members of the opposite sex, and people who are different than they are. By example, he can instill a desire to give something back to the community when its needs are greater than theirs. But mostly, a good father involves himself in his kids' lives. The more responsibility he has for a child, the harder it is to walk out of his life. A father has the potential to be a powerful force in the life of a child. Grab it. Maybe you'll get a greeting card for your efforts. Or maybe not. But it's steady work. <laughs> that's what I used to tell our youngest daughter, Kaylin. That's why I get paid all the big bucks. <laughs> to be your dad. Oh, if I could do it all over again. <laughs> I would thank God more for those years with my children. For sticky faces. For constant questions. For toys on the floor. For not enough privacy. And for the words, Daddy, I love you. I would thank God for all of that. And so much, much more. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you that you've called us to not only be men and husbands, but you called us to be fathers. And on this day, as we celebrate Father's Day, God, I, I pray that you would help all of us. Most of us now are granddads. <laughs> we have a do-over. We get a chance to make a difference. Like the comedian road, we can actually give money. The things that we have, the love that we have, all those things that are so much more important than money. We can give ourselves. And when we give ourselves, no one can snatch that out of the hand of a child. I pray you will help us to be godly men, godly fathers, godly husbands. We love you, Lord. Thank you so much for loving us. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. All God's children said...